Greetings, and today we'll focus our attention on Chapter 9, The Female Serial Murderer. And again, there's a lot of uh, information in your textbook. And one of the first things I'd like to focus on is the updated research that uh, Dr. Hickey presents, the 2004 to 2011 research looking at uh, female killers, and uh, female serial killers, rather. And looking at the percentage of offenders in team cases was 50%. So there is a theme there of uh, team serial killing. Also, we see that the race of the offender tends to be Caucasian, with 93% being Caucasian. We also see that the average age of the offender at their first killing was um, 40.7. So, uh, you know, we have that uh, particular number to consider which um, shows perhaps a late onset of homicide compared to some other uh, groups of uh, homicidal uh, perpetrators. Their average age at um, uh, being uh, apprehended was 47.4 with an uh, average span of killing around seven years or so. And if we look at uh, the, um, the uh, epidemiology of female serial murders, we do see some uh, similarities and some differences when we compare to the male serial killer. We also see uh, that 21% um, use poison only and 21% use strangling or smothering only. 7% uh, use shooting only and 7% use stabbing only and another 7% blunt force only. So we can see basically that poison and, and strangling were uh, some of the more common uh, methods or, of course, a combination of uh, methods. The victims of the female serial killers tended to be um, adults, 93% were adults. Also, um, uh, strangers, only 50% uh, were, were the victims. And we see also 14% were patients, 14% were elderly. Um, and, and so then we begin to see uh, some other differences here with the uh, victimology. The female serial killers sometimes are referred to as the uh, quiet killers because they're basically invisible uh, to the public and more difficult to detect. Uh, many times we see that they're given uh, sexist names that sometimes, um, uh, you know, downgrade the uh, serious extent of their violent uh, behavior, such as uh, the giggle giggling grandma and the killer granny and uh, so forth. Interesting case, of course, is Eileen Warnos, and um, even though she was considered, you know, to be the nation's uh, first female serial killer, that wasn't the case at all. It just shows you how uh, much lack of knowledge the media, the press, and people in general have about female serial killers. And, and so that's important uh, to, to look at. We've already seen some of the theories and ideas related to serial killing, and I would ask you to apply those to, to females as um, well. And um, also I would ask you to take a look at some of the differences related to sexuality between the male and the female uh, serial killers in terms of uh, sexual violence. We see that um, that that is much uh, less likely to have a sexual component in the serial murder with the uh, female serial killer than the male. We also see place-specific killers are common among uh, the female um, serial killers who tend to kill, of course, in, in the same location in these cases. And sometimes we see, like in the healthcare setting, nursing homes or hospitals or in private homes. And we also see um, that uh, in looking at the data, about a third of the female serial murderers were place-specific. So that seems to be uh, a common. Uh, poisons um, were uh, used frequently in, um, uh, some, in, in, to kill the, the victims. And um, again, that can be more difficult to detect and uh, will decrease... Um, uh, you know, uh, suspicions in, in, in many cases, unless we see a pattern occurring, for example, in a uh, hospital or among family members. One thing, though, we do see 
in the history of female serial killers is the um, uh, broken homes or the traumatic uh, experiences, the child abuse, the uh, neglect, uh, the emotional abuse, the sexual abuse, and uh, the general traumatic uh, early childhood experiences. Of, of course, what we have to consider is that the vast, vast, vast majority of abused kids, even severely abused kids, do not grow up to be serial killers. And there are certainly serial murderers that seem to have a okay uh, childhood. So, you know, we have those cases uh, to, to consider as, as well. And we get into some of those debates. Well, is it learned behavior? Is it based on some type of, type of mental disorder, some type of genetic predisposition? Uh, what is uh, going on with uh, that situation? What I would like to do, though, is direct your attention to a book. And this book is by David M. Booth, B-U-S-S, -S, called The Murderer Next Door, Why the Mind is Designed to Kill. And, and it's published um, by the Penguin Press. And it's, in, in my opinion, it's an amazing book. Uh, you don't have to necessarily agree with his theoretical model to appreciate the wealth of data and information that he has in, in this book. And what he has done is he has gone into... Uh, he, he's asked questions in his lab of um, everyday people, people you'd meet on the street, people in your classes and, and the like, if they've ever thought about killing someone, and if so, who and why and how would they do it and what stopped them. <clears throat> and that, of course, uh, is a very important question. It's a question also Lonnie Athens asked in his um, uh, interviews with violent offenders, he asked not only, you know, how did uh, the situation occur that led up to the murder, but he also asked, what stopped you from killing someone? That's an important question to ask in these cases. So we do find with serial murder cases that there are um, some potential victims, but something occurred where they decided not to kill. But I would like to uh, read a quote on page 30. Uh, Dr. Buss says that, that they, he said that the patterns that I discovered in the triggers of homicidal fantasies support a radical new theory of murder that all of us house in our large brains specialized psychological circuits that lead us to contemplate murder as a solution to specific adaptive problems. That is why we found that homicidal fantasies are so common. Now, if you think about it, you've probably heard people that you know, maybe even you've said before in a, in a, in a anger moment that you'd like to kill someone, or maybe you've heard threats before. I can tell you once I was watching a show about these uh, young men in New Jersey who were getting, uh, one of them was getting married and the limousine driver was running late because of traffic and, and on, on national television on this you know, reality show, the guy says, look, if you don't get here on time, I'll kill you. And of course, I'm thinking, well, is that um, a, a serious threat or is that just talking big or, you know, how do we interpret that? Was he really planning to kill the limousine driver uh, if he was late? Um, and, and, and so a lot of times you may not see this, although we begin to see it emerge more in, in social media where uh, people may threaten uh, other people. Uh, if you think about this whole idea, think about if you've ever heard someone talking about another country and how they should be nuked, just nuke the whole country uh, and teach them a lesson or nuke large cities and not even considering the consequences of the deaths that would result to innocent bystanders, innocent men, women, and, 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 and children. And another thing, of course, and, and you all know uh, by this by now, that uh, my specialty area of research is genocide, that we have some of these uh, genocidal perpetrators. And, you know, we have to ask, are they like ser serial killers uh, or are they different? Or how do we put uh, that together as well? And is there really some type of mechanism, some type of... Um, uh, system in people's brains that um, at least encourage or, or or lead to homicidal fantasies or thoughts. 
And so you have to always ask that question. In many of the cases in, in, in uh, Professor Bush's work, he, he talks about um, uh, asking people, have they ever thought about killing someone? And, and they report yes. And <clears throat> For example, one woman, uh, you know, said that um, she wanted to kill her uh, ex-friend who stole her boyfriend away, and she wanted to stab her in, you know, in the eyes, and so on and so forth. But why didn't she? Because she didn't want to go to jail. Uh, so, so again, you see some of these scenarios un unfolding, and so it makes us, you know, take a closer look as we try to understand all this. And finally, I think it's important to recognize, and I hear over and over and over again, someone's caught uh, or identified as a serial murderer, and people might say, oh, well, the person seems so nice, oh, there are no warning signs. And of course, if you remember from our earlier chapters, that that is exactly the successful psychopath. The successful psychopath is able uh, to fool people and charm people into thinking that they're a very nice uh, person looking out for their welfare. Uh, moving to the movies just real briefly, I, I think an excellent example of what I, who, who is playing a psychopath is in the, the um, uh, series House of Cards about politicians. Kevin Spacey plays the role of a congressman and, and just does a superb job of, of showing you that highly educated, sophisticated psychopath. And um, if you ask me, he deserves Academy Awards for his portrayal there. But if you look at his behavior and how he acts and how the script is set up, and also look at his wife who has some of the psychopathic characteristics as well, and then think about uh, how that may uh, relate. I thought that was one of the more realistic uh, portrayals. And, and so again, we have to look at uh, the reality versus the fiction and uh, what is presented in the media and what is not and how some cases are much more interesting to the public than other cases, even though that may not be a good idea from a research and knowledge gaining perspective. And this wraps up this uh, video. Thank you.